ice cream. And so that's about 48 years ago. Except for Bill Clinton's election in 1996, Arizona has always been a rescue from upgrading on this country. So, hey, Donald, you're cutting in and out. I don't think that many people can hear you. Um, is there a, can we try troubleshooting really fast? Well, why don't we go ahead and begin with the speakers and let them kind of begin and, and introduce itself. Okay. Let's do that. Um, Patty, do you want to start us off with an introduction of yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Patty Ferguson Bonney. I'm Pornisham from Louisiana, and I teach in the Indian Legal Clinic at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. I'm also the faculty director of the Indian Legal Program. And the Indian Legal Clinic runs the Native Vote Election Protection Project, which was uh, created in 2008 to ensure access to the polls for Native voters in the state of Arizona. And um, we've been working for the past two years to get ready for 2020 and then of course the pandemic happened and <laughs> things changed a little bit so maybe we'll talk a little bit about that but i'm happy to be here and happy to be invited and part of the conversation so Eduardo, why don't you go next Eduardo or stephanie why don't you go next Hey everyone, um, this is Stephanie Malonado and I am the campaign director with the um, grassroots organization called Lucha, also known as Living United for Change in Arizona. Um, Lucha is a social, racial, and economic justice organization that focuses on organizing alongside Arizonians um, and Lucha was pivotal on ensuring the increase of minimum wage, the increase of minimum wage in 2016. So that's how a lot of folks know us. Um, yeah, so super happy to be here. I will go next. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this is Eduardo Sainz. Thank you for putting this panel together. I'm the Arizona State Director for Mi Familia Vota. Uh, Mi Familia Vota is a national organization that has been doing civic engagement uh, across the country in six different uh, states, Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, Florida, and Texas. Uh, this election cycle, we had the pleasure to do an expansion to Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Uh, looking into do some expansion work as well in Georgia for the runoff uh, this January 5th. Uh, we're super excited to be have been building the electorate from the ground up, uh, from helping Latinos become naturalized U.S. citizens with our Jaisora campaign, ensuring that as they become naturalized U.S. citizens, they participate in our democracy, as well as uh, having a leadership development pipeline for from youth. Uh, from high schools and college students to ensure that they're the next generation of leaders. Uh, we have also housed wonderful individuals uh, that have run our organization in the past and now are serving as elected officials. Uh, for example, Rep uh, Representative Teran in District 30 has served as a regional director for Mi Familia Bota and now is serving and leading our communities here in Arizona, as well as Francisco Heredia, the council member uh, in Mesa, uh, which has been former uh, national field director for the organization. So not only uh, electing good leaders, also building leaders to run for office and ensuring that our community has the political power uh, to choose elected officials that are gonna be aligning with our values. So thank you uh, for this panel and I look forward to uh, expanding in a deeper conversation. But you can you tell us how you got involved in getting the vote out in the group that you work with? Uh, absolutely. I uh, actually got started and involved in uh, in Mi Familia Bota through SB 1070 days. I am a person, I'm a Mexican immigrant. I migrated to uh, Arizona uh, in 2006. I uh, started to settling in in Tucson, and as we were settling in, I was able to see so many opportunities that this great country had to offer to us immigrants and to the Latino community. But I was also able to see kind of like a dark side of this community as well of racism and, and policies that were being implemented to make it harder for people like myself to thrive and to have a quality education, be able to go to uh, our public universities. And 
our hopes when we when we migrated to this country was to have a better education and to be able to have economic stability. Uh, with th that same hope, uh, I remember in SB 1070 days that we walked out of my high school. I was a high school student uh, from Flowing Wells, walked out, and we were outside of the Arizona State Building protesting, making sure, you know, raising our voices and promoting that John Brewer could veto SB 1070. And uh, how I found out that SB 1070 became law was by a white older woman on the third floor of the Arizona State Building in Tucson with a sign that said, haha, she signed it. And that was a moment that I realized it triggered me that we need to make sure that to, in order to create real change, we could be protesting all day long outside of the Arizona State Building, but not until we have politicians that align with our values, we would be able to see real change. And since then I started looking for avenues to get involved. I started volunteering at my church at Sat Saint, uh, Sacred Heart in Tucson, able to help hundreds of dreamers apply for DACA. And that was until the day that one of the organizers, her name is Ana Karina, came into my church and asked us to volunteer for immigration reform. And I actually signed out a pledge card saying that I wanted to volunteer. And since then, I haven't left the organization and built in, in this vision of building political power for our, for our communities here in Arizona uh, and ensuring that as we're building that political power, we're also electing individuals that are going to represent us and and ensure that politicians that are that are not representing our communities, we can remove them from office. And we have successfully done that with Arpaio in 2016, with um, with Trump this year, with Martha Maxali, and ensuring that we are electing leaders that are going to represent our values. I can go next. Um, I'll just, I think the question was, uh, tell us how you got involved in your voting work. And I, prior to coming to ASU, was working at a private firm and my first cases um, were working on redistricting on behalf of tribes. And then on behalf of the Navajo Nation, we filed uh, litigation against the voter ID law that was passed in the state of Arizona in 2004. It had a disproportionate impact on native voters and we were able to settle that litigation to expand the types of IDs that were acceptable on election day. Notwithstanding that, we noticed that tribal members were still being denied access to the ballot because of the voter ID laws. So we met with the Intertribal Council of Arizona and created the Native Vote Election Protection Project to ensure that Native people weren't turned away from the polls on ele election day. We established a hotline and also a field program where we send people to Indian country on election day because a lot of the election protection programs don't actually go into Indian country. And even the parties when they had observers weren't going into Indian country. So we really wanted to make sure that there wasn't this void um, and to address the issues. Um, there are a lot of issues with tribal members having non-traditional addresses, which um, sometimes is misinterpreted about them not having an ID that matches because a lot of times the, count the counties always change their addresses. So for example, my physical address is on the Gila River Indian Reservation. I have a made up address. And if you in, input it, it's on my driver's license into the voter registration database, the county changes the address. So everybody who votes at District 4 Service Center, your physical address for elections is District 4 Service Center. So your ID will never match. Um, and so when this ID law was passed, a lot of people were being turned away from the polls uh, because their IDs didn't match, but there's no way that the voters' IDs could match. So um, we worked with the Native American Bar Association of Arizona to make sure we had legal people in the field um, and with the Intertribal Council of Arizona to have this field program and then also the hotline. And then over the years, we've been working on convenings between tribes and counties so that counties could better understand tribes needs and tribes can better understand the counties deadlines because a lot of times counties are not trying I don't know if they don't think about it, but not really thinking about the access issues for tribal people. So we're trying to elevate those issues so that they could be addressed before the election. 
Yeah, and Stephanie, if you could answer the same question, um, how'd you get involved with the work that you do? Um, yes, so I mean, growing up, I, I come from a mixed status home. My mother was undocumented. I was born here in the US along with the rest of my siblings. I actually, um, I'm originally from New Mexico. I decided to go to ASU back in 2011. Um, and the only reason I moved to Arizona was to attend ASU. Um, in 2012, my mom made the difficult decision to self-deport back to Mexico. I was a sophomore in college at the time, and I had to make a decision for myself and for my future was, do I go to Mexico to a country that, you know, I know my family comes from, but is very um, native to me? Um, or do I or do I stay here by myself and continue to fight for uh, my future and for my siblings future because I had a sit my sister was 14 at the time and my brother was three. Um, so my mom left to Mexico in fall of 2012 I decided to stay in the US. Um, and I decided to change my major at the time I was pursuing um, psychology I wanted to work at a school and be a counselor. Um, and basically, um, I decided to change that I, I had a lot of questions. I, I was very confused as a 18, 19 year old as to why were there policies that were separating and ripping families apart. Um, my mom was not a criminal. My mom didn't do any of the things that the narrative has painted um, you know, uh, immigrants that come to this country. My mom came to this country for a better future. Um, and I myself um, felt myself very frustrated. And I remember changing my, my degree at ASU to pursue political education, um, poli sci, sorry, poli sci, um, to be able to become a lawyer because I thought that in, in order for me to shift um, and fight for families, I needed to become a lawyer. After interning at a law firm, I shortly learned that becoming a lawyer was I was working with the laws that the that would separate our families. And I started to have a lot of moral questions is that do I agree with policies that are separating families that are engaging children um, that are that are causing um, incarceration. Um, and I got it, I learned about this amazing organization at the time, Lucha, that they were organizing. I didn't know what organizing was. I didn't understand the concept of organizing. I was like, do they organize papers? Do they organize phone numbers? I didn't understand. Um, but shortly after I, you know, being at Lucha, I started to learn um, what it meant to truly organize community and what it me meant to have conversations with people like myself, with people who have been in who had been directly impacted by laws like SB 1070, who were impacted, who didn't qualify for DACA. Um, and from there, I you know, started off my organizing journey in 2014. In 2016 was my first electoral campaign. I did voter registration, um, you know, and the biggest learning that I've had and why I continue doing the work, because a lot of people still ask me is like, why do you still organize? Why do you still, you know, do campaigns? And one of the reasons I always share is that, you know, in order for, for us to see ourselves represented, in order for communities of color, women of color, um, first generation, second generation, it starts from being able to lead and do the work um, and actually get our people registered to vote. Because in order for us to shift the political climate we live in, we need people who, who we need people who look like us to be voting. We need people who understand the challenges, the day-to-day -day struggles, knowing what it's like to not pay your phone bill, your, your phone bill, your phone's being shut off, knowing what it's like to have to work two to three jobs to be able to support your family, knowing what it's like to come home and you know be afraid of you know getting sick and not having access to health care or um, sick paid leave. So um, that's why I continue to do the work um, and what drives me every day is my mom may not ever be able to come back into the country, but I know that in order for us to, to shift and to push and to continue to change the narrative that we live in is that we need to shift who is in power. We need to shift who are the individuals that are representing us. And we also need to co-govern with a lot of these individuals. So that's what brought me into my the work, my personal story, my personal
struggle struggles but what has kept me here is the young people it, it has been people like Eduardo on this call that we worked closely together um, to be able to shift Arizona and it's taken a lot of phone calls a lot of door knocking it's taken being out in the in 120 degree weather chasing people on a parking lot to get them to register to vote that has what's gotten us to this moment and you know um, all of those um, experiences, not only myself, but other individuals is what got them into the work and continues to keep us here, so. You know, I like that idea that we're in the political moment right now, and this generation is very much politically aware, but could, could we think about political awareness and the question possibly, uh, how do we make our young people politically aware? That is a great question. I think that it, it comes with the investment uh, to young people. In co it goes with investing in communities of color. It goes into giving individuals an opportunity into participating in our democracy. There is, you know, there is this question that often I've been getting asked by reporters in the last 10 years. When is a Latino giant sleeping going to wake up? And is is, you know, we've been up, we just need to be involved in the process. We need to be asked to participate. There is a huge investment when it comes down to white communities and the investment in participating in our democracy, but and there is a huge gap uh, investing in Latino communities, in young people, and investing in, in actually women running for office and getting involved. So as we invest in communities of color, as we invest in communities uh, that are young, that are the future of this country, our communities are showing up and participating. There's no coincidence that this cycle, we took it upon ourselves, organizations like Mi Familia Bota Lucha, to be at the forefront and fill that gap, fill the gap of the lack of investment and ensure that we are prioritizing those communities. And if you look at the numbers compared to 2016 to 2020, Latinos performing 300% more than what they did compared to 2016. And that was because of all of us, as Stephanie was describing, making calls to our peers, knocking on doors, having conversations on high schools, on um, este, uh, colleges, universities, etc. And then also there's this huge wave of young people that were not of age in 2020, 2010, when SB1070 was happening. And we literally saw our parents breaking down. And I am sorry, excuse me, that I get emotional, but I was able to see that my loved ones literally packing everything that they own and travel back to Mexico, going to another state, because it was so miserable life here. And the country and the laws told us that we didn't belong. And you know, all of those young people are now running organizations, running for office and showing up and electing people that are gonna represent us. And if those people are not gonna represent us and continue to promote racism, we're gonna take them out of office. Yeah, and I guess just to follow on that with regards to the Native American community, I mean, in general, there's a lack of trust of government officials, which stems from the systemic racism and policies, uh, which makes people feel like they're not part of the political fabric and they've been ignored for so long um, that that impacts participation. So the goal is really to connect um, through education and awareness, because really as a native person, those elected officials are impacting your everyday life because of the federal trust relationship. I mean, even um, your like very existence could be terminated. And uh, I know some tribes have been working on providing more of that education because we really don't do enough of that in general, um, you know, in civic education for our students, but really connecting the dots and trying to inform people about how this makes a difference, I think is important. And I think with the pandemic that we've seen, um, like it was interesting, I work with people at ASU and they said, oh, I didn't know that they have people in Arizona who don't have running water because, you know, as highlighted on the national news that we have communities in Arizona that don't have public transportation or 
um, access to broadband and um, running water and electricity and people didn't know that here not everybody but some people didn't until it was on the national news and highlighted and that's why there were more impacts on reservations initially with the with coronavirus and so um, and a lot of that has to do with government decisions and infrastructure and trying to uh, educate young people about why that's important and how you can make a difference. And I think elevating our veterans because they've always fought for this country. Our native people have fought at higher rates than or participate in the military at higher rates than others. Um, and to come back and not be able to participate in democracy. Um, they fought for it and then aren't able to participate. So um, I just want to mention like one of the tribes has a campaign and it says our ancestors couldn't vote, but I can. So we should be taking advantage of that and have our voice be heard. And so there are a number of tribes who are working on that civic education and starting with the youth council and younger people. Um, and I think that's really important. Betty, could you tell us a little bit about the history of citizenship and the right to vote for native people? Yeah, so Native Americans in the United States, um, some of them were citizens before 1924 if they were considered civilized and um, uh, through different allotment acts and things like that. But um, because Native Americans served at high rates in World War I, um, they, the Citizenship Act was passed in 1924. And that basically granted citizenship to all Native Americans, but it did not automatically extend the right to vote. Um, actually, in Arizona, there were <laughs> efforts to prevent the right to vote um, so that there was litigation to prevent Native Americans from voting. Uh, since they were wards of the federal government, they were considered non, not competent under the Arizona Constitution. And that wasn't reversed until 1948 when some other veterans uh, from Fort McDowell um, tried to register to vote and the Arizona Supreme Court finally overturned that. But, you know, I just want to mention like Native Americans were in World War II and um, Navajo code talkers. Uh, but for them, you know, would the war have ended whenever it did? We also had Hopi code talkers, um, Choctaw code talkers, lots of different code talkers that people don't talk about. But uh, it was because of their efforts that natives in Arizona were able to gain the right to vote. But also at that time, there was a literacy requirement. And so most natives couldn't vote because of that literacy requirement. So it wasn't until those literacy requirements were removed in the 1970s uh, through federal legislation and then a challenge by the state of Arizona that Native Americans were really able to start voting and participating in elections. Um, with the election victory of Joe Biden, how do you think this will affect people of color? Well, Yeah, I mean, I can go first. Um, you know, a lot of the times, I think I can speak from my own experiences and from the members and leaders from Lucha, you know, Joe Biden was not our first choice. Um, you know, a lot of our a lot of our members as an organization, we actually endorsed Bernie Sanders. Um, Bernie Sanders um, painted the vision um, and the direction that a lot of our people were in, our members, our leaders, our youth, um, even our, our senoras, right? That, you know, were old way, you know, that were in their 50s, 60s. Um, however, you know, after we saw that, you know, Bernie wasn't going to be the candidate, um, as an organization and as people, we started to understand, you know, we understand how, how, how and why, you know, um, Bernie Sanders was not the candidate that, you know, was going to go head on with um, Donald Trump. And I think that there was a lot of um, understanding and a lot of walking with community and having conversations around how, you know, the, he might not be the most ideal candidate that our people, you know, our people endorsed and our people believed in, but he was a bet, you know, he was a candidate that 
gave us the opportunity to be able to have more accessibility than we've ever had in the last four years. I mean, many of us have seen what have happened in the last four years under this administration with the rescinding of DACA, for example, um, that has impacted thousands of young people, not only in Arizona, but across the nation. Um, we have seen what has happened with, um, you know, the criminalization of Black um, Black individuals across the country, the policing, um, and the lack of accountability um, to ensure um, people are safe. Um, we've also saw what happened this year um, with this pandemic and how many Americans have died across the uh, uh, across the country, and not and not even to speak of what has happened here in Arizona due to this pandemic. And you know, I believe we believe as an organization that you know, Biden is going to be the candidate that is going to be able to listen um, and also create more accessibility and resurface a lot of these conversations that were essentially, um, you know, blocked off with this previous administration. We have a lot of hope that DACA will be at the forefront of this administration where we are gonna be able to, um, you know, start talking about DACA in a real way to be able to alleviate thousands of young people right now that are sitting, you know, that are 50, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old that are undocumented due to the fact that DACA was rescinded. Um, we also, um, you know, we have hope that with this administration, we're going to, we're going to see some positive steps taken forth um, due to this pandemic. So I, you know, with this administration, we know that every, you know, no candidate is perfect, but we do know that we have more of an ability to have um, accountability conversations, accessibility conversations, and there will be more positive steps to ensure that our communities are now represented and we at least have access where before we were, again, we, were, we, we have been blocked off for the last four years. Barbara and Betty? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, it brings us a lot of opportunities. Uh, we are, as Stephanie was describing, I think that our, we are talking about the same communities that we're serving. I, I, I do recognize the need for bolder, more progressive policies for our communities. Um, but I also recognize that uh, having and taking Trump out of office was our number one priority for, as an organization. And Trump, since day one, started insulting our community, had put everything on the back burner, and also started to dismantle pro, a huge uh, programs like DACA that had benefit myself and other people uh, to be able to work in this country and this country that we see our homes. Um, and being able to have an administration that is going to listen to us being able to have an administration that is going to prioritize our people of color on the cabinet and actually have influence on the different avenues, having a, a, a president elect that also is going to prioritize public education. It's a victory for a community. And yes, are, we are going to put pressure to ensure that all of those campaign promises get reflected into ensuring that there is real policy behind it and that we prioritize an immigration reform on the first 100 days, that we prioritize access to healthcare for our communities, that we pay people a living wage, and that we continue to push for pieces of legislature that promote our democracy. We see that when everybody participates in our democracy, when the more of communities of color participate, we see a change and we see the, the reflection of communities wanting to see investment in public education, being able to have and help our undocumented brothers and sisters that have been in our country and contributed for so long, being able to have um, a good job that is enough to put food on the table and sustain our families. You know, we are neglected as, as a community because our parents and our loved ones have to be working two, three jobs to put food on the table. And that brings a lot of instability to our houses. And we wanna make sure that as we are continue to move forward and elect these leaders, yes, there, it brings an opportunity, but also brings a way to also empower our communities to decide what is the things that we need to prioritize. Another issue that we haven't talked or that I haven't mentioned is the environmental crisis that we live on. 
Uh, I am a young parent and, um, you know, I we were living in Central Phoenix area and my children were uh, not having difficulties breeding because of the uh, poor air quality that was a high Latino neighborhood. And it happens because of, you know, decisions that these elected officials are making from the federal level to our, our municipalities. And as we get engaged and we elect people that claim to be on our side, we also will continue to hold them accountable to prioritize those key issues that are for our community uh, and ensuring that we can breathe, breathe clean air and have clean water and ensuring that there are, we all have a quality public education and access to higher education, et cetera. The community is united and we will continue to ensure that as we elect people into office, we hold them accountable for the community's priorities. So just building on what Eduardo said for um, native communities, I think some of you are probably aware that there was a big effort to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline because it was going through um, some sacred territories of, of tribes and then it would impact the water. And um, there was movement to deal with that in the, in the court system and through um, the administrative bodies before um, Trump was elected. And then when he was elected, it just reversed course. Um, I mean, now there's still things happening in the court, but I think it showed us a couple of things. One, that our youth and people uh, can get united behind causes that are important to us, protecting the sacred sites, ha having access to water. Two, that Trump was not concerned with those issues for tribal people. That was very clear. Um, and, and, you know, and the other thing that he did is that he reversed the designation, um, the full designation that was set aside for Bears Ears. Um, and that was a blow to tribal communities who found that, you know, as important sacred sites. And then me, I'm from a tribe in Louisiana that is located in the fastest eroding basin in the United States. So these climate impacts are real and the ways that they're hitting our communities are real and they're um, the um, communities of color and tribal people are bearing the brunt of these with uh, their communities literally um, be going underwater, whether it's in Louisiana or Alaska or on the Upper West Coast. And to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord um, really made a statement with regards to all of these things make a statement because they are pro industry, not environment or securing the earth for future generations. Um, and so I, I think that that's important to tribal people and hopefully uh, Biden has an actual platform. There's never been a Native American in the US in the presidential cabinet. Um, you know, maybe this will be the time. There needs to be some commitment uh, to Native people because of the turnout, I think. And um, there should be some real commitment to our issues. But we know that under this upcoming government, there'll definitely be more diversity. I'll also mention that the Assistant Secretary who Trump put in charge of Indian Affairs um, was from her ties and work were really focused in the past on oil and gas. So I think that just sets a tone for everything with regards to what's important. And I think we're looking forward, you know, he has Biden has Nate, President elect Biden has Native people on the transition. And so, you know, that in and of itself is different than the last administration to actually talk to people. And as Stephanie mentioned, having some access. Um, just thinking ahead a little bit, so we as people of color, where do you think we're going next? So, I mean, I think as, um, you know, not just as people of color, but as people in the United States, I think we really have some issue, issues that we need to address that are systemic. And of course, I'm coming to this from a law field, but I mean, real social justice issues that disproportionately impact 
uh, people of color. And I think, you know, all of the protests um, this summer highlighted that those issues. Um, and I think that we need to address those issues. Um, in order to move forward, we need to address those issues. So the young people, and it wasn't just young people, but I think I'm encouraged by young people because for the native movement, whether it was DAPL or, or something else, um, missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, all of those things, like we need to elevate those issues and have real discussions about them. Um, and I think, you know, one example under the Trump administration was to get rid of implicit bias training or to not have that. I mean, I think we need that in all areas of our society, especially our justice systems, but everywhere. Um, like we need to be made aware and we need to um, address these issues. So, you know, and I think that we need to continue these conversations and these movements because there have been so many people engaged with it and see how this administration is going to lead conversations on that. Stephanie or Ed Barn? Okay, I'll go. Um, I mean, I think one of the, the things that, you know, we think about whenever like where do we go from here or like where are we going um and i think you know um talking about systemic racism that exists is super is going to be super key i mean we even though biden won we still saw seeing how many people voted for trump um millions of people still showed up um and voted um the way they voted they still believed in that rhetoric they still believed in that ideology that is racism. Um, because when people say, you know, I voted for Trump because of his business side, or, you know, he, he, he's the man that gets, it, uh, gets things done, we heard that. But he also spread it like, yes, he gets things done, but he's also a racist and he's a homophobe and he's, um, you know, he's anti-woman. How many, like that ideology and that rhetoric is still very present in this country. Um, people still truly believe that what he was sharing and what he has done over these last four years is okay. Um, and whenever, you know, as a woman of color um, that is now raising a young daughter who is a, um, you know, she's a, a third generation Latina, um, it's going to be super important that we continue to tackle these conversations of what systemic racism is and what is, um, yeah, what are the conversations that we need to drive and how are these policies and administrate, not only administration, but also local policies and local um, governors and, you know, elected officials, how are they showing up for our people? How are they showing up in, you know, also institutions, you know, whenever we say, um, you know, oh, like, for example, when I went to ASU, you know, I was more desirable student because I was, you know, I, you know, I had a story, um, I was a woman of color, that also speaks to um, the institutionalized racism that, ex that exists, not only in institutions, but across, um, you know, job public sectors, private sectors. So I think continuing to educate the community and not only the community, but also being able to have like a top-down approach is gonna be super key on how do we create spaces to have these conversations? Because I know in my workplace, it is acceptable to talk about racism and uplift, you know, when we feel singled out or when we feel, um, you know, uh, we feel a certain way, but there's other, you know, places that we can talk about that because that's not, you get in trouble, you can get written up, you can get fired, um, you can get, you know, um, you can get shut down. So I think that continuing to uplift and continuing to shine a light on um, that racism exists, racism is real. And even after we, we turned Arizona blue, um, we were still very close of continuing to keep Arizona red because there are thousands of people who live in this state who still follow and believe in this white, suprem white supremacist um, rhetoric. Um, and yeah, like that rhetoric and that ideology um, that continues to oppress people, um, people like me and people who um, you know are considered the minorities? Um, so I'll pause there and I'll pass it on to Eduardo. Yeah, um, 
thank you. Thank you for the questions and thank you, uh, Stephanie and, and Patty for sharing this uh, panel. For us, it's about to continue building the electorate, continue empowering our communities to show up and to continue also to build the next, next generation of leaders. We need to empower the youth to ensure that they could run for office, that they could run our organizations to continue mobilizing Latinos, getting people to have and promote our, and advocate for the issues that we care about. Uh, and also as we are electing these excuse me, as we are electing these new leaders, how can we ensure that our communities are part of the governing structures of all of these uh, new elected officials coming into office? Ensuring that communities of color have a voice and that they could participate and thrive. And, you know, the, as, as we get to describe what has happened and the lack of investment in the Latino community, there's not a lot of spaces uh, in in the con across the country and in Arizona, like um, like Mi Familia Vota or Lucha, that has an avenue for people to continue to 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 thrive and to continue to have an avenue uh, for of participation. So, just you know, where we go from now is continuing to build that electorate and continue to hold in, in, uh, elected officials accountable and promote our community's uh, priorities. One follow-up question to the current discussion is, uh, how do you think grassroots organizing should build on the, on the achievements of the past election? And are you concerned about political complacency once Trump is out? Uh, what are the strategies that you think will help um, make these movements sustainable beyond the, beyond the moment? I, I don't know if I can answer this question um, because there's not a ton of grassroots organizing in Indian country. Um, there should be more in Arizona, but there's not as much. And I think that's just the nature of the distance and, and space. But I would say moving forward that we still need to hold our officials uh, to account. We know that there are systemic issues with access to the polls for native people that need to be addressed. Um, and a lot of times tribal leadership um, takes the lead, but we do need um, some grassroots organizing in Indian country um, to, uh, I think that would empower people more um, coming from that level. There's some, but there's not a lot. And I just want to mention, um, because Mi Familia Vota had worked on getting the voter registration deadline extended. And I think that's so important because people may not know that until September 4th, if you were a native person who lived on a reservation, you couldn't register using the online system. Because reservations were shut down, um, there was no, all, voter registration is usually done in person and there weren't events or fairs and things like that to, to be had. Um, and so that really limited the ability to do voter registration. And so, you know, that changed after September 4th, but extending the deadline really gave people more opportunity um, to call the Secretary of State's office to try to get voter registration forms. So I think we still need to push our officials to make changes so that everybody can participate and um, participate have more access to try to participate more effectively. And I think the native community would probably benefit from learning from other communities about, you know, what they can do to do a better job for grassroots organizing. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, uh, you know, you have to take look at the numbers, right? Like that lawsuit was critical into the victory. Right now we're waiting for data to come back from the voter file, et cetera. But that lasso gave us 10 extra days um, to ensure that community members were uh, active, that they could participate, that they were registered to vote and that they could cast their vote on November 3rd. Uh, that, those 10 days led to 35,000 new voters. 
And if you look at the margin uh, between Biden and Trump, that's the victory. <laughs> that could have be meant that if those people that registered and showed up on November 3rd led to the victory of Biden and led to ensuring that those voices were heard in our democracy. And, you know, th there were a lot of arguments like, well, it's so easy to register to vote online. I can't believe you're extending this. And it's not true. Our communities have been disenfranchised and put on roadblocks for online systems to not work for us. For example, as Patty was describing on the Native community, I work closely with immigrants. I'm a migrant myself. And to get registered to vote online as, you know, if I get, uh, you know, sorted in and I get my uh, certificate of naturalization on my hands, I cannot register to vote online because motor vehicles has me as a non as a non citizen, and so then you know in the middle of a pandemic, then in order to be able to register to vote online, then you would have to make an appointment to DMV, and then after making an appointment, you have to show up your your certificate, and then they have to issue a new ID, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which you know people that continue to ask you know put that framework of or that fake narrative that it's so easy to register to vote and that this was not that, that this was not a barrier it they're lying and they are, and they're the same people that have been putting these barriers into place for people not to be able to access our democracy so you know where do we go from here? The question is like what are we going to do from this political gain is this was a community's victory it was because of people of color leading the way and young individuals getting creative and ensuring that our communities could participate in our democracy. And we will claim this victory because this victory was ours. And this victory had been on the build for the last 15, 10 years of the civic engagement work that we have been doing collectively. So what advice would you give to students and others in academia to try to get involved with organizing? either on campus or off campus? Yeah, I mean, I, I always say um, organizing starts with one person. Um, you don't need, I mean, obviously you wanna build, um, you wanna bring like-minded individuals, but I would say if I, you know, a lot of the work that we do um, as organizers is just starting conversations, sharing our stories, um, sharing, um, you know, our shared values and connecting on those values to be able to to lead us to action and a lot of the work that we do is high school and college organizing um and what what advice i would give is like um you know at first you might sound like a crazy person because i know when i started organizing back in 2014 people were like what is that like what are you talking about going and knocking on doors why are you calling these people my friends i mean i was what when i started organizing like 21 years old you know 21 year olds are normally not knocking on doors with clipboards talking to voters um they're you know normally thinking about like where am i going to go you know celebrate my graduation where am i going to you know where what's my next step where am i going to continue grad school um but as as people who who want to shift and you know we understand that, the, you know, we understand what solutions are needed in our communities and being able to come together and start conversations and start pushing and start advocating for ourselves is going to allow us to be able to build um, and achieve bolder policies, opportunities, um, and creating spaces for ourselves. And I think organizing could be in any way, shape, or form accessible to anyone. Um, organizing can be organizing because you want to, you know, change what it, we've had folks organize in high schools to be like, we need more water fountains. Um, students were able to advocate and get more funding to get water fountains to as large as this victory that we had getting, you know, folks out of office. So organizing comes in many ways, shapes, or forms. And I would say, um, don't give up. And I, I mean, I'm seeing the other question that's coming in. It's like one of the, the biggest challenges, um, you know, we've faced as organizers is, um, 
I mean, we work with a lot of youth um, and a lot of our youth face like challenge. I mean, right now we're in a different organizing moment because of the pandemic. A lot of our work that we used to do was in person. We would have folks meet up at different spaces, at different parks, at, at coffee, at um, different coffee shops and be able to, you know, phone bank and reach more people. Right now we're sitting in a completely different space where, um, you know, what some of the challenges have been access to technology. A lot of our folks don't have access to Wi-Fi. They don't have, um, you know, computers in their home. So access, access to technology is a huge one. Another challenge we face um, is um, you know, being able to to reach everyone, right? Um, we might we spend hours calling and calling community, but you know, a lot of people are working at different hours, so really reaching our people. So I think right now we are in a really interesting place where we are really excited about 2021. We are creating opportunities to continue investing and engaging with young people or people of all ages who want to be part of this of these moments, but also build their own moments. So um, I'll pause there, but I think advice that I would give is like, you don't need a hundred people. You just need one to two people to come together, start conversations and start building out and reaching people and envisioning a better future, a better community, a better um, place for you and how to, you know, what are the ultimate goals we wanna reach um, and just being able to engage and talk to each other and build community spaces that's what organizing is about. Is there a question from people who are listening and watching? The three people, our three discussants, our three, our three guests. I don't know what you said, Don. I didn't miss that. Uh, I was asking the people who are listening and watching if they had any questions for the three. Okay. There are none right now. I want to ask this question to the three of you. You know, you're really investing a whole lot, and I admire that. Uh, but on a personal level, what is it that you want people to know about the work that you do? I guess I can start. I, I mean, I think um, for me, it's nonstop. There are always issues to be addressed. Um, and it seems like it's an ongoing challenge. Um, so I usually say justice is a continuing struggle. And for, you know, in Arizona, the population is moving. There's more people in city centers, uh, urban areas than in these rural areas. And so we try to do what we've been doing with the Indian Legal Clinic is um, documenting information, creating reports. Our students have testified at hearings um, because uh, before a few years ago, there was not, you know, a lot of information about access to the polls for native voters. And so we did, we worked with our, our partners, um, the Native American Voting Rights Coalition to have field hearings across the country. And I think one of the questions was what can academics be doing? Like academics can be writing about stuff that could then be used as advocacy pieces to um, request more access um, to show that, um, these issues have a discriminatory impact. And I think that's really important, um, being able to provide a report and then use that to say, hey, this happened the last election, provide that to the tribe. And then the tribe can go to the county and say, I would like this addressed for this upcoming election. Like we have data that, so for example, in Apache County before this election, they had over a thousand people on the suspense list, which means they weren't placed in a polling precinct. It's happened in the past. And we talked to the county and they're like, oh, it'll be no problem. Um, and then of course on election day, it was a total problem. Like they weren't answering their phones and poll workers didn't know what to do. They were turning people away. Um, and so this, you know, we tried to address as many issues as we could because under the law, we had people trained to tell them they have to give you a ballot, um, even though they weren't. But this is definitely something that is gonna be highlighted to say you need to address these issues for the future. Um, and so I think we have to consistently 
you know, even though there are advances, we have to consistently address issues because voter suppression is real. I think that the legislature will probably, you know, introduce more things to try to um, maintain that stronghold. And we need to be aware and um, be active participants um, uh, to do whatever we can to identify the issues and and litigation, I think, as me familiar Vota knows, other people know, is like so expensive. So, you know, if we could try to get it resolved at the county level or state level in advance, that's great. But there are some things that are going to take larger challenges. Stephanie, are you for Yeah. Um, can you restate? Sorry. Um, yeah. On on a personal level, what is it that you would like people to know about the work that you do? Um, I mean, I think for, well, I know for myself, the work that I do is, it, it, I feel like it, it came out of a, a moment of, of fear. Um, and I continued doing the work because I deeply fell um, in love with the, with the vision of being able to fight for you know, what my, my mom, what my dad, what my ancestors couldn't fight for. Um, and now as a mom myself, I'm able to, you know, show up every day um, and co-create a world where, you know, we don't have to worry about, you know, our wages, where we don't have to worry about, you know, having, going to, to college, where you don't have to choose about playing basketball after school or having to work a part-time job to help your family pay for the bills. You know, I, I believe in, in collective and unifying visions. And I think that on a personal level, um, you know, I do what I do because I I deeply believe in the power of people, and I believe that people power will, will it overpowers money power any day. Um, and I think that um, I'm I know I'm not alone in this, but that's what keeps me driving. And you know, like Patty said, the work is nonstop. Um, I had a week, you know, in quotes, a week to take some time off, and I still kept getting reporters and nonstop calls and, you know, emails about, you know, tell me about how this happened. Tell me about that. So I think being able to, to take pauses are important, but I think in the work that we do, there is no pause other than, you know, than our personal pauses and knowing how to keep ourselves motivated um, and oriented as, you know, as in a hum humane way possible. So um, yeah, I'll pass it off to Eduardo. Eduardo, very quickly, you have the last word. Yes, thank you so much. I think just to add, um, we need to make sure that we invest in, in our communities, that uh, we invite people to take uh, a leadership roles within our organizations, within the communities that we live on. And there's always a way to advocate for a better Arizona, for a better future. We ourselves are the future of this country. And, you know, Latinos uh, in the state of Arizona, the medium age are 27. So we're, we will continue uh, to have a lot of on our, on our hands to make and create the change that we all need. So thank you very much. And we're, in, we're at the end of our hour. And uh, I want to thank all three of our discussants. And I'm so jazzed up. I'm, I'm waiting for the next election. I want to go out and vote right now. But thank you, everybody. Take care. And thank you, Rachel, for handling everything, uh, the technicalities, and for Becky and uh, helping to uh, pull all of this together. And we look forward to uh, next time. Everyone take care. All right, thank, thank you. you.